Hello everybody, I'm honored to address you today. I want to credit Jim Nussel, his staff, and CUNA for making this virtual conference happen. These are challenging times. My wife Kelly and I would like to share our condolences with those who are suffering or have lost loved ones throughout this pandemic. And having just welcomed our first child last month, we'd also like to extend sympathies to those who feel isolated in quarantine or cannot receive support from their families and communities. I'm hopeful that we'll be meeting next year in person to talk about the outstanding work that credit unions did during this very difficult, very strange time. As for today, these are my first public remarks as an NCUA board member, and I would like to talk about a couple priorities. The first of which is clearly managing the fallout from the pandemic. Obviously, this job I have is a bit different than I expected it to be when the White House first contacted me in November of 2019. Back then, I thought I'd join the NCUA board at a time of a strong economy, and we'd be preparing the credit union system for the inevitable rainy day. Well, that rainy day arrived in a big way just days after the last GAC. My colleague, Rodney Hood, spoke last year on Wednesday, March 4th. Do you remember that following Wednesday, March 11th? It felt like everything changed that day. We learned that Tom Hanks had COVID, the NBA announced it was shutting down all games, and Disney said it was closing its parks that weekend. That Sunday, the Fed implemented emergency rate cuts, the first since the financial crisis. Those five days are sometimes called from Hanks to Banks. But I'm proud to report good news. As we enter the second calendar year of this pandemic, credit unions remain in a strong position. Collectively, our uh, nation's federally insured credit unions have ample liquidity, reflected in a 76% loan to savings ratio. They also have surplus funds equal to 31% of assets, with 60% of those surplus funds in liquid assets. Asset quality is high, with the credit union delinquency ratio sitting at 0.5% as of last September. That means delinquencies are at their lowest level in over 30 years. The system's capital ratio is stabilized at 10.4, well above the prompt corrective action well-capitalized level of 7%. Fortunately, the past has proven that credit unions are resilient. In the aftermath of the Great Recession, the Wall Street Journal reported that over four times as many banks failed than consumer credit unions uh, from 2008 to 2010. The credit union model works, and it's why I'd like to see more of them across the country, which brings me to my second priority which is streamlining the regulatory burden, especially the process for starting a new credit union. Now, can we really make substantial changes? Well, I think we, we can agree that the only silver lining to the current crisis is that we've had to experiment with new ways of doing things. Some of those changes will probably stick around even after the pandemic. For example, many states have made it easier to do telemedicine via video chat. The list goes on. Shopping habits, work from home, the NCUA moved to virtual exams and saved a lot of our time and your money. Now, do all these experiments work perfectly? No, but that's what experiments are. Some work, some don't, like how sports and concerts are definitely better with people in the audience. And in-person conferences still serve a purpose. But some changes are worth continuing even after we go back to normal, like how we're going to look at continuing to use virtual exams going forward. But I'm trying to make a broader point here, which is that the old way of doing things should be re-examined. You all know that, but we in government, we are usually a monopoly provider of our services, not subject to market forces that demand constant improvement. You all know you can't treat every problem by just adding payroll. And we shouldn't need a pandemic to make us look for better processes. So one area I'd like to focus on is why is it so hard to start a new credit union? There are a ton of benefits to making it easier for de novo credit unions even for existing credit unions. For one, we may find ways to streamline the regulatory burden for both de novo and existing well-run credit unions. There has got to be an easier path for de novo credit unions. I'm from Maine, and I was pleased to hear about a new credit union chartered in Maine just last year, until I learned it took nine years to accomplish. Nine. Things may move a bit slowly in Maine, but not that slowly. There are self-reliant, accountable people who want to work cooperatively to charter a new credit union that they will own. Those folks deserve a clear path to make that a reality. And all of our talk about inclusion, diversity, and the underserved, well, fixing the de novo process is a way to actually help the underserved, not just talk about it. The NCUA is already aware of CUSOs, vendors, and other credit unions that want to help those that want to start a credit union. So I'm going to be talking to those who recently started one and those who want to with the goal of working with NCUA staff on a new easier path. Making it easier to start a credit union means having more financial services in places that have few. And for everybody else, it means more competition for your business. And how about consumer financial protection? The best consumer protection has always been vigorous competition. 
allowing American businesses to do what they do best, innovating to find ways to give consumers a better choice, a better product at lower price. Thus, it's impossible to protect consumers without first examining if the NCUA's regulations inhibit credit unions from better serving their members. Credit unions can't deal with every issue by snapping their fingers and hiring more people. And it would be unfair and counterproductive if the NCUA dealt with problems that way. And there are some problems we can solve simply by increasing transparency and implementing private sector style feedback mechanisms that make our lives better on a daily basis. And if we're talking about regulatory reform in 2021, I would be remiss if I didn't mention blockchain technology and digital assets like cryptocurrencies. Credit unions have always been innovators, and we know that if it serves members better, credit unions will want to do it. To that end, the NCUA may want to look at the actions of another regulator, the OCC. That agency recently provided guidance around the custody of digital assets and the use of stable coins for payments. Stable coins, as you may know, are cryptocurrencies designed to minimize price volatility. And the OCC's guidance moves the United States closer to the real-time payment systems already used in other countries. Now, not everything the OCC did may apply to the NCUA, but I look forward to working with Chairman Harper to see what we can take from the OCC's experience to let you all innovate as you've always done. So in conclusion, if we can do those two broad main goals, okay, give you what you need to manage the fallout from the pandemic and streamline the regulatory process that inhibits the creation of new credit unions and hurts your ability to help the underserved, then we have a bright future ahead of us. And I'll feel like I made an impact at NCUA. My promise to you is this, I'll always remember that the money in the credit union system, including the funding for the NCUA, belongs to you, the individual member owners. We all share responsibility and interest in spending our time, money, and resources efficiently as possible. Our incentives, you might say, should be aligned. Ultimately, I envision credit unions not hurriedly complying with requirements to get us off their backs, but rather fulfilling their regulatory duties holistically and with pride knowing it'll pay off. That they're achieving milestones designed so that they will thrive and not just checking boxes for the sake of it. This country is great because of its diversity. A credit union in Juneau, Alaska serves a very different community than one in Pensacola, Florida. It's our job as regulators to make sure they both get the job done safely. But how they do it, based on their community's unique needs, is a decision best left up to them. I look forward to continuing the legacy of protecting our nation's credit unions and their member owners so that the American dream may endure and thrive. I appreciate the opportunity to address you today, and I hope to see you next year in person at this same conference. Thanks again, and let's get to work.